was really placed on my heart to do a series about the return of Jesus Christ, the Lord's return. And um, I know it's not an easy subject, but it's not a real complicated subject either. And so we're going to enter into that today. And then my husband brought to my attention uh, some major ministries in America were online this morning preaching the same thing. So we're in the flow, folks. We're in the flow. Ready or not, preparing for Christ's return. Now, I want you to remember that. That's what this message is about today, preparing for Christ's return. This is a very controversial subject, and it can be very divisive. It can divide people. It can cause there to be a little bit of strain in friendships, Christian friendships, or in, in different segments of the body of Christ that believe it's going to happen one way, others believe it's going to happen another way, others believe it's going to happen another way, others believe it's not going to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> there's all kinds of uh, interpretations that have been extracted from the scriptures concerning the return of Christ. So sometimes we don't know if we're going, if we're coming, or if we're staying, okay? So what we're going to put the spotlight on today is let's be ready. Let's be ready. Now, some of you that have been Christians for many years have probably already formed an attachment to one of the interpretations of Scripture concerning the return of Christ. Some of you are newer, and maybe you have never heard messages about the return of Christ, and so some of these things will be new that you'll be learning today, all right? So please understand that believing positions that are different amongst us should never be a cause to divide us or for us to sit around and debate and argue about, all right? Now, there can be a segment here, a percentage of people that believe that Jesus is going to return and he's going to take all of us out of here. There's others that believe that Jesus is going to return and do it a different way. And we're going to explore three of the main um, theories or interpretations that are out there. So if one pocket believes this and one pocket believes that and another pocket believes something else, don't talk about the divisions of it. Let's all do one thing for sure and let's make sure we're ready for it, however it happens. And the reason that we shouldn't argue or be controversial or allow this to be debated is because it's not a heresy to believe differently because no one has ever experienced this, okay? <laughs> Hello? No one has ever gone through this that is amongst us. So when it all happens, you know, Pastor Norman has a, a fourth theory he wanted me to mention called pan tribulation, meaning I just believe that it's going to all pan out. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to be ready however it happens, okay? So that's what we are going to concentrate on today is, is getting ready, being ready, being alert, staying in a position to encourage one another about the Lord's return, okay? Um, so it's not a heresy if someone believes different than you. So there's no reason you have to convince them. Just love them and get ready and be a functioning part of the church and the body of Christ. There's some vocabulary that you need to understand, especially if you are young in the Lord or this is your first time to be exposed to these things. And one is the Great Tribulation. We're going to mention that in this series, the Great Tribulation. What is it? It's a seven-year period that will be hell on earth. While we were singing the last round of our song, that he is our everything. I turned to Matthew 24 and was reading it, and Jesus is preaching, and he says, this is going to be a unique time. There is going to be more suffering 
and more pain than has ever been released on the earth since the beginning and never will again be released to this dimension. So it's a unique time of suffering. And there have been empires that have crushed and persecuted God's people throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. You know, all the apostles were, almost all of them were martyred for preaching the gospel. There has been great, great horror that has happened. If you were a part of Rwanda a few years ago, I was invited to go to Rwanda. And then I was uninvited because they said, whatever you do, don't come over here. Because within a matter of 30 days, they killed something like 2 million of their own people through the persecution that came. And many of those, of course, were Christians. So there's been, you know, Ukraine, they could say, well, this is the great tribulation, what they are going through right now. So we have not experienced that here in our country. But there's parts of the world that say, wow, this is, this is horrific. Is this the end time tribulation? But the Bible teaches that the great tribulation, those seven years, will be such a unique suffering that will come under an empire of evil headed by the Antichrist. And so this is a very important thing to understand when we're talking about the return of Jesus. And then the, the word millennium, which means a thousand. And that is a thousand, in contrast to the great tribulation. You pass that. I'm going to come back to that on a different Sunday. The millennium is a thousand year reign of peace. And the Lord Jesus Christ will be king. And he will reign in Jerusalem. And so we'll come to those subjects. Um, I have a couple more Sundays that I'm allowed to preach um, through November, and I'm free to preach what subject I want to preach. Um, and so on those two, I'm going to come back, and on one, I'm going to talk about the rapture and the resurrections, and then on the other one, I'm going to talk about the coming of the Antichrist and the millennium. Is that okay with you? Okay, so we'll, we're not going to cover all those now. So those of you who read n numerous books and are well-educated, don't get nervous. I'm not ignoring things. I'm going to come back because what we're going to talk about today is enough for today. Amen? Amen. Okay. Um, here are three of the most common positions or views of the return of Christ. One is the post-tribulation. It's a belief that we will go through seven years of the great tribulation before Jesus returns. So in First um, Thessalonians 4.17, one of their support scriptures is, Together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And some of them, I won't name the names, but precious men and women of God, I admire greatly, um, they have this position of, of the return of Christ being after the tribulation because it says here that we'll meet the Lord in the air. So they believe the Lord will come and the tombs will be open and all believers at that time that are alive will rise up in the air, meet Jesus in the air, but we won't go to heaven. We will come back to earth after the tribulation to the final battle of Armageddon and then the millennium. Okay, that's that belief. They support it with the words in the air because it doesn't say to heaven. Um, so I put, I'm looking in Spanish, trying to translate to English. Um, the post-tribulation is the belief in a combined resurrection and gathering of believers in Jesus coming after seven years of intense suffering and persecution on the earth. Many wonderful people believe that. One of the most notable was Pat Robertson, who is a great man of God, and that was his position on the second coming of the Lord. I believe, at least it was in the past when I read it. Um, 
so we don't fight with each other, okay? Another one is mid-tribulation rapture. And the mid-tribulation is believers will be present for and go through the first half, three and a half years of the tribulation and then be raptured. So the belief there is that at the halfway point in the tribulation is when Jesus will come and take us out of the tribulation so we'll be absent for the last three and a half years. They believe that the first three and a half years of the great tribulation will be distinguished by natural disasters, plagues, pandemics, etc. And the second three and a half years will be the wrath of God, which believers will escape. It's often called the wrath, pre-wrath rapture, and some call it the day of the Lord. God will remove the church from the earth just prior to the outpouring of his wrath. That's the second very common view. Revelations 3.10 says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently those first three and a half years of the tribulation, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, the last three and a half, that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. That's what they believe. Um, then there is pre-tribulation. And pre-tribulation is where believers in Jesus are taken up prior to the seven-year tribulation. First, all of the prophetic words that God spoke by Ezekiel, by Daniel, by Jesus, have to be uh, fulfilled, and they have been, as far as prophetic teachers can ascertain. So it could be any moment that the coming of the Lord would happen, and the <clears throat> pre-tribulation believe that we will escape all of the grand tribulation with the coming of the Lord. First Thessalonians, and it's kind of long, but we'll read it. We're going to read it again when we come back to teach on this. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that he, that we who are still alive, I already read this to you once, <laughs> are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel with the trumpet, call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, that's my particular attachment, okay? It doesn't have to be yours. It's mine. And so when we come back to talk about the rapture of the church, I'm going to concentrate on that one. Is that okay? And I'm going, well, if it is or if it isn't, I'm going to do it anyway. So, <laughs> and, and we're going to take it from the Greek so that we, we understand it. And that doesn't have to be your attachment. We're all attached to the fact that Jesus is the ultimate king that's going to change the history of this planet, right? And reign forever and ever. So we're, we're going to look at these things. Um, Matthew 24 says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day the Lord will return. Or exactly what position to hold. So whatever position you hold, the question is, are you ready to leave at a moment's notice? That's the question that we're going to face today, okay? In the twinkling of, of an eye. We're not going to have time to figure this stuff out. And if we can't run with the, the horsemen, the Bible says, if we believe we're going to live through the tribulation, how in the world will we run with the chariots? I mean, if we can't get our act together today and not fall into depression when things don't go our way. How will we ever handle the worst evil that has ever happened on this planet during seven years of tribulation? So any way you want to look at it, we got to get ready now. Okay? Okay. You know, when you go on a journey, you pack a suitcase and I'll tell you what, I've traveled a lot in my lifetime, a lot. And in ministering the word of God to different nations and different people groups. And probably the most tedious part of all of it is packing. <laughs> 
because when you're going to be on a platform in front of thousands of people and go to different types of meetings, you have to think, this is what I'm going to use, this is what I'm going to use, this jewelry. And when you're in front of uh, women, you need something that sparkle. When it's men and women, you need to pull it back a little bit. And so, you know, you, you have to think all these things out. And when you've done it so much, packing just, oh, it's, it's you dread packing. Well, sometimes we dread packing spiritually, too, putting real attention to how are we following Jesus so that we will be ready when he comes at the moment we least expect. The Bible says it will be like a thief, that if you knew the thief was coming, you'd get ready. But you're not going to know when it's going to happen, okay? And so you've got to make sure that your house, your, your life is in preparation for the coming of the Lord. So we're going to look at some things that the Bible says about being packed and ready to go. I have a friend who travels the world, and the first time he went to preach in Europe, he, uh, his wife wasn't around when he was supposed to pack, so he packed his clothes. And he got there. And he just had just an hour to get to the hotel, shower, dress, and they'd pick him up and go straight to the platform because his plane was delayed. And so he gets in the room and he showers and he puts on his suit and, and he gets his shoes out and he has packed a black shoe and a brown shoe. And they're different styles and they're both for the left foot, okay? <laughs> And so he goes, oh, what in the world am I going to do? So he called the, what do you call it, the, the, the driver that was assigned to him. And um, he said, I have to have some shoes. I, I didn't pack my shoes. And the, the guy said, well, we don't have time to go shopping. He said, well, find somebody that has a pair of shoes, 10 and a half, and, and bring them to me. So he brought him an old, dirty pair of work shoes, work boots. And he put him on with his suit, and he looked like a clown. But he had to go out and preach that way until he could get through that session and have free time to go buy him a pair of shoes. Well, you and I are not going to have time to go out and get all of this right, okay? we got to think about it right now and pack well so we're ready and excited for the coming of the Lord. Um, and that's true whether we are... Uh, we receive the Lord at his return, or if we leave this body in our earth visit to go to heaven, we want to be ready, right? Okay. The Bible tells us how to be ready, and one of the things is with overflowing love, overflowing in love. Romans 12, 10, be devoted, devoted, not tolerate, Put up with, a ver si te aguanto otro día, huh? but be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Okay? In Galatians 5.13, it says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. So you can say, I'm, I'm free. You know, I don't have to pay attention to all this. So, oh, wait a minute. But do not use your freedom for self-indulgence. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Very quiet here. So, who do you need to love? Who do you need to move from, I'm putting up with him, I'm putting up with her, to, I love her, I'll never forget a women's conference here at the Crossroads where we had a forum of women. And I turned to Dr. Edie Gonzalez, a member of our church, clinical psychologist, but a devoted woman of God. And I had a question that had been given to me by someone in the audience, and it was, my mother has dementia, and she's violent and very difficult to attend. How do I deal with my mother? And Edie said, you don't deal with your mother. You love your mother. Are you dealing with people? <laughs> when God has called us to 
love people? Who do you need to be reconciled to? Who do you need to forgive? You say, well, but i am been terribly hurt. And I know, I think we all have at some time or another, but we need to forgive. We, it, it's just a requirement. It's the axle which makes the wheels turn in Christianity in a relationship with God is forgiveness. You know, if we don't forgive, we can't expect God to forgive us. That's what he says. And if we don't forgive, we open up a portal, a door, a gate for tormenting evil spirits, demons, to come in and begin to minister to our minds. Okay? And then we're in worse trouble. We become bitter, we become closed off, and we begin to lose in life. So we've got to get packed Get ready. Who do you need to release before the judgment of God? Release in the courts of heaven. Go and say, whatever case is against them because of how they treated me, I want it to be stamped. It's over. Remove the case. Dismiss from judicial process from God. I require no vengeance. Now, what God wants to do, that's between him and them. But I'm going to get out of the picture because I am going to forgive and let it go. And, and, and get over myself, okay? Don't pout when God blesses someone you don't like, okay? <laughs> don't pout over it. But rejoice, rejoice that God is good to everyone. You know, sometimes people leave churches because someone in the congregation did something to hurt them. And that is so frustrating for pastors because the pastor didn't do anything. And they love the pastor, but they leave the church anyway. They leave because someone offended them. Oh, my God. If I left every time I've been offended by people in this church, I'd have been long gone at least 20 years ago. Okay? at least 20 years ago. There was times that I would drive up in the driveway and I'd sit in my car and I would just go, I can do this, I can do this. I don't like this place, I don't like those people, but I can do this. <laughs> and you break through that and you see the light at the end of that dark tunnel that's trying to suffocate and steal your relationships. I look at you now and I love you with the depth of my being. I need you. I love you. I want you to be encouraged. I pray for you. In preparing messages like this, it's not for me to just get up and hear myself talk. I'm eating this for my own spiritual growth, but I'm doing it because you are VIP, very important people in the sight of Jesus Christ. And I recognize that and I honor that. But that doesn't mean I've never been hurt by some of the things that you've said. Not all of you. That's the, mm, no, 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 it's not like that. It's not like that. It dissolves. The pain dissolves. The hurt dissolves. In your marriage, my gosh, you can never be married for 48 years without being hurt, offended, and you have two choices. You either pout and keep a record of wrongs to throw it at your mate and destroy your family, or you grow up, put on your britches like a man or woman of God, put your belt of truth on, and say, you know what? As I have been forgiven, I forgive. And as God doesn't throw this in my face, I'm not going to throw this in anyone's face either. This is the end of it. Jesus is my everything, and anything that is lacking from my spouse, donation to my well-being, Jesus meets that hole. And so I have nothing to complain about, and I will keep on doing what God has asked me to do within this relationship. And I know Norman does that all the time. I get on his every last nerve. I know that. I don't try to, but just who I am is not who he is, 
okay? And that's just a fact of marriage. It's a fact of parenting. It's a fact of working on a job. It's a fact of having connected relationships with people. So you have to walk in love if you are going to be ready because the kingdom of heaven is filled with love. <laughs> There's no haters on the train going there, okay? So we need to keep our hearts pure before the Lord. And another one, number two, <clears throat> is deep-rooted faith. A faith that's not based on outcomes or possessions. <laughs> it's not based on I asked and got or I expected it was fulfilled. Now, those are good things. Sometimes we ask God, you know, for, for houses and lands and cars and children or whatever it might be, and God grants us that request, and that's wonderful. But that's not where deep-rooted faith is established. It helps us to see the faithfulness of God, and it enhances our living if we are generous people and we continue to give and be obedient to the Lord. And sometimes things just don't work out the way you felt like God promised you they would work out, okay? And that can cause people to become bitter. And you don't want to be a bitter bundle of emotions at the return of Jesus Christ. You want a pack to be ready. And that means you're going to develop a deep-rooted faith that goes beyond, I can't think of the word in English, um, I was like, well, whatever, receiving things or outcomes, results or outcomes. Deep-rooted faith, let's read it in Romans 10, 17. It says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. That's where you want your deep-rooted faith to be, in Christ and what he's done for you, that he's with you. We went on vacation for a week the other day, and and my husband, pastor, um, had a word for us, and it was a word from the Lord. I am here, and I care. And we went with that every day as we went out to explore on our vacation. He would say to me, Sandra, the Lord is here with us, and he cares. And I would say, yes, Norman, the Lord is here with us, and he cares. When we pray over our food, we say, thank you, Lord, that you're here with us, and you care. And you've got to get that deeply rooted into your spirit, man, into your life, that whatever you're going through, he said he would be with you unto the end. He is there if you have received him as your Savior, and he cares about what you're going through. But the results that you expect aren't always the ones that you get. But he says that he will work all of it together for good for you according to the call that you have responded to and his purpose in your life. Now you can know that that is true. Now sometimes the promises come about and they're even better than what you expected. But sometimes the promises don't turn out the way you thought. And we use this often, but in the, in the death of our child, it's August 24th when he went to heaven, and, uh, you know, we're reminded that was not what we thought was going to happen. We were planning a wedding for that day, and we didn't think that this was going to be the result, but it was, and we had to accept it. But I know where my son is today, and I'm at peace with that. And I know that at the return of Jesus or my exit into heaven from earth, my exit from earth into heaven, I, I will have no whys because I will be totally fulfilled in seeing my child again. So I have that hope. And that is because I have a deep-rooted faith in Christ. Let's read what it says in 1 Corinthians. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything in love. I remember, and I've shared this before, but there's always new people. I was engaged to be married to a very well-known preacher. And we had everything, the date. We had a house and furniture, honeymoon prepared, everything. When he called me and said that the Lord had spoken to him, that he was not to marry me because it would interrupt the call of God on my life. 
Well, I got very angry and very hurt. And I carried that grief inside of me for over a year after that breakup because it was so public, it was so romantic, it was so off the chart. And, and so it really did a number on my emotions. But it was true because he had no interest in Hispanic people or Latin America. And it would have altered the call that God had given to me for a Latin harvest which my husband then later came, and he had that same vision, that same call, that same purpose in life, which just actually drew us and knitted us together in the love of Jesus. Well, I went to Santa Barbara, California, to try to get over some of the impact of the sorrow of the destruction of my life at that moment. And as I was sitting on a rock, looking down on the beach at Santa Barbara, I saw how serene it was and the lapping waves and the smooth beach. And then all of a sudden, this couple with a dog and a Frisbee come running down, and they mess that beach up until it was just trashed with all of their playing and running and after the Frisbee and playing with the dog. And then they went on. And I looked at how rough the beach looked, and I said, Lord, that's the way my heart feels, that it's just been trampled on. And all of a sudden, the lapping waves came up, and they smoothed that beach out again. And the Lord says, yes, and that's what your future looks like. So keep your eyes on me, because during that time, I tell you, I didn't know whether, I, at times I pray and I say, God, I know we're supposed to get married, and this is just confusion, this is just the devil, this is just people talking to him, and so I come against those gossips, I come against those spirits, nor you have spoken over this union, and I'm not going to let it go. And then I'd come back the next day, and I'd be crying on the floor, laying and sobbing and saying, oh, Lord, I give it to you. I let him go. I let it go, Lord. I can accept a no. And then I'd come back and say, no, I'm going to hold on, and I'm going to believe God for this blessing. I was like a crazy girl. I didn't know where my faith was going. So one day I, in prayer, I said, God, please give me more faith. And I heard him just like I hear him today. And he said, Sandra, you don't need more faith. You've got more faith than you know what to do with. You need to know what to do with the faith you have. And I said, well, what do I do with it? Do I hold on or do I let go? He said, no, you place it in my integrity toward you. Okay. Okay. Deep-rooted faith where we believe that God's integrity toward us is always to be there, to care, and to bless. And so we trust him. It's called trust in the Lord in all your ways, and don't lean on your own understanding. Hello? Amen. Okay. Number three, secure in hope. Verse Peter says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, see, that's what we're doing today. We're being alert and fully sober. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. You know, the world is in trouble today. When you turn on the news, do you get frustrated? I do. I don't know who to trust that are giving me information. I don't want to be a cynic. I don't want to live as a cynic. And I don't want to fall into conspiracy theories. I want to walk upright before the Lord and be a sane woman. But I can see that this world is on the brink of destruction. It's not too difficult. You don't have to be too smart to see that we're in trouble, okay? We're in trouble. But if we begin to just focus on that, we'll start being fearful or we'll start shrinking up in our ability to live. But we need to be filled with hope that good things that God has planned for us and that we know that Jesus somehow, whether he returns with us or he takes us with him or, or, or whatever happens, he is going to be the ultimate fulfillment of this earth's peace and renewal. 
He is going to be the one that changes the order of what is going on. And that is our hope. We're on the inside loop of that knowledge, and that should fill us with excitement that the Lord has planned things for us that are so wonderful, so glorious, beyond our ability to imagine, that are waiting for us in the future. So there's no doom and gloom whether we leave this body to be present with the Lord or this body is changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortal to immor immortal, okay? We have a lot to look forward to. So we live in that hope that God is preparing all kinds of good things for us to enjoy. Death swallowed up in victory. Hey, that should get you going, all right? That's a promise of the Lord in the days to come. And so hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised. Our hope is strengthened by experiencing God. If you've experienced God, if you've, if you've lived as a devoted Christian for a while, you've experienced God in the ups and downs of life, and that strengthens your hope because you go, hey, this is real. This is real. This is real. I prayed. And things happen. This is real. Amen? So that strengthens your hope. And hope fills darkness with light. And that's who we are, light in this world. So all is not right with the world, granted. But one day, the world will change hands, change leadership. And King Jesus will rule and we'll, we'll all be set right. The fourth one is unblameable holiness. Now, when we talk about holiness, that can be a challenge because most of us don't feel holy, and if you feel holy, then you're in trouble, okay? Because now you're saving yourself, okay? Now you have self-righteousness, and that's, that's not going to cut it, okay? Um, let's read 1 Peter 1.15. But just as he, well, we're packing. Are you know what we're doing? We're packing, folks, okay? Love, faith, hope. Now, holiness. But just as he who called you, this is, this is hard to read if you don't understand it. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> but we have to understand the difference between righteousness and holiness. Let's look at 1 John 2.28. And now, dear children, continue, continue, does that something like progress, go forward, in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. So I want to distinguish two things for you today. And one is the difference between righteousness and holiness, okay? Righteousness is what we receive through Jesus and his perfection. We are provided a right standing with God. That's why feeling holy is not going to cut it because self-salvation doesn't work. It just doesn't work. We can never meet God's standard of holiness completely and always. We have no way to save ourselves. God is not going to look at ways that he can pretend that you're not a bad boy. God's not going to look at ways that he can pretend that you have never sinned or make an exception for you. Because some people think, well, yeah, I've done all of this in the negative column, but I'm okay with God because he sees I've done this in the positive column. Uh-uh. God is not an enabler. He does not enable you to sin by looking past the sin. He's not going to compromise his holiness to be your enabler or my enabler. God honors the integrity of the purity of heaven. 
and satisfies his standard. That's one of the reasons for the judgment seat of Christ. Because if we're going to be in heaven, something's got to happen with all this junk that we've done that will be accountable for every word and every action we've ever done during our lives. You think there might be something you said or something you've done <laughs> that maybe you didn't repent or make right and it's still lingering there? That's why it's so good to quickly re repent and get over your anger or your pouting because those things will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Because God wants to embarrass you? No. It's because heaven is pure. And we can't have impurities in heaven. So it has to be burned off of you, burned away. And only those things that are holy and acceptable to God will remain. Okay? So God honors the integrity of the purity of heaven and satisfies his standard without turning his back on us. And when I wrote that at my iPad yesterday, I had to stop and cry. Thank you, Lord, that you uphold your standard of purity and holiness, and you don't make an exception. You don't enable me to sin, but thank you in doing all of that, that you do not turn your back on me. Why? Because of Jesus. It says in the Bible, God has reconciled the world. He's reconciled you. He's reconciled me to himself in Christ. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The perfect life of Jesus was given to us and our imperfect record was laid on him. That's righteousness. We are before God as if we had never sinned because of Jesus. When the Romans crucified criminals, they nailed the list of their offense to their hands when they nailed them to their crosses. The list of your offense was nailed in the sight of God to Jesus' hand when he died, and it was paid for. And so we get Jesus' perfection and sinless life, and he gets our record of crimes, and he covers them with his blood when we believe in him. Holy means to be set apart for God. Holiness means to go in a different direction, um, to part company with sin and wrong actions. That is what holy or holiness means. Uh, holiness is what Jesus preached. It puts a mirror to your face and allows you to see the log in your eye, the sins that you have in you, instead of you wasting your time pointing out other people's sins. And then you go to him and you say, Lord, I ask you for forgiveness and grace to convert me, to change me, to turn me around, to do what pleases God. Holy is our conduct, living according to God's commandments. It's having that personal relationship with Jesus where God's ways are chiseled on your soul. So when you do something or say something or want something or yield to something that is not favorable in his sight, you feel it. You feel it inside of you. And that's your time to back away and say, Lord, I see the log. Please forgive me. And his grace is so beautiful. I don't think his grace depends on anything that we do because I've seen his grace unfold itself to some of the most miserable people I know. But I also think that forgiveness and asking forgiveness, repentance, opens the door to grace so that grace as beauty pours out in our lives. You know, I mess up like Norman was talking about. I mess up. But when I do, 
I just immediately come to the Lord and say, Lord, I blew it. Forgive me. This is wrong. And some of you might see what I do and hear what I do and not even think there's anything wrong about it. But I know deep down in my soul that the Lord is not pleased with it because the Holy Spirit is there convincing me to, uh, to change, to convert, to be separated, to be holy unto him. And that's a beautiful way to live. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It means what the scripture has said there, that we're continuing on. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But we're in process. We're progressing, okay, in our walk with the Lord. So holiness is what you do with your resources, what you do with your time, what you do with your attitudes, what you do with your money. You know, what, how do you live out your testimony for Jesus Christ as his child? So be ye holy, even as he is holy. The works of the Lord toward you are holy, holy. They're even separated from what you deserve by his grace. And we want to walk holy in our actions by being separated from sinful ways. Being holy is to have a God consciousness and not a sin consciousness. It's not to spend all the time thinking about how you want that. And lust after that, instead of saying, you know what? Jesus satisfies my heart. Hmm? I want to think about Jesus. I want to think about, we sang it today. You sang it today. He is my everything. I want to think about Jesus. And that is bringing that progressive work of conversion into our lives. We're already in right standing through the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ toward our lives. But we will be accountable for every word and every action that we have that has not been filtered through repentance and grace and correction. And then in the last one is willing and active in service. You know, you ain't going to have time to get it right in the twinkling of an eye. All right. We have a scripture for that or not. Did I give you one? Matthew 25. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. This is Jesus teaching. And they all became drowsy. He's talking about, ten, about virgins, okay? The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And in Jesus' preaching, there were virgins that didn't have a lamp and didn't have oil in their lamp to have a light to go and meet the bridegroom. There were others that did. They had their lamp, and they had their oil burning in their lamp, so they had light, and they were able to recognize the moment and, and be joyful at the coming of the Lord. But what is the lamp? The lamp is your appointment. What has God appointed you to do? What has God called you to do in this moment? What is your appointment? And the oil is the anointing, the capability that God gives you to be a light in this world and to serve him and to serve people. It may be through your giving. It may be through your, your career, through your education, teaching, uh, driving products so people can eat and, and function in their life. Whatever the assignment is, preaching, teaching, you name it, being the medical field scientist, whatever it is, you know, oh, yes, Lord. I know they, they were tr scrambling around trying to find their lamp. When the Lord returns and the shout and the sound of the trumpet and the archangel announces his return, it's going to all happen quickly. That's not going to be the time to go, well, what was I supposed to do with my life? Okay. And, and I knew what to do, but I didn't do it because I was too scared that I wouldn't be able to do it well. No time for that. Okay? This is the time to say, I'm packing. I'm ready. I got a lamp. I got an assignment. I have an anointing to fulfill that assignment. And I'm going to live for him today. The assignment may change a little bit according to the seasons, but I'm always going to be in tune with the Holy Spirit to know how I am to serve God in my lifetime. Do you have a lamp? Do you have an anointing? 
All you have to do is just step out and go for it, as God has called us all. So we need to do that and not put it off. Oh, someday I'll give a good offering. Someday I'll show up and work in the church, be a volunteer. Someday I may even usher. Oh, my God, wouldn't that be something? There's no some days about this, friend. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to pack up and get ready for the glory that is coming before us. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, the good news is we haven't left yet. <laughs> so there's time for us to get packed. There's time to get ready. And if you are here today and you've never Pray to prayer to accept Jesus in your heart. Then that's a responsibility that you have. You say, well, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe he's God. Well, the Bible says it's not enough to just believe it in your heart. You have to confess it with your mouth. The Bible says if we will confess him before men, he will confess us before his father. There's a judgment seat of Christ coming, and I want the Lord to know when they call my number and I walk up there that the same one that has said, I am here and I care, will be standing there and saying, Father, I know her. I know her. She confessed me before people all over the world, and I stand to tell you, she's your daughter. She's your daughter. This is her final home. This is her reward. This is her inheritance. Oh, you have to confess him with your mouth. Believe in your heart. And then allow the Lord to start this progressive work of conversion, of changing you, of taking you away from what destroys, and having you trust him to make choices that lead to your living the best life you could ever live in your years on this earth. So I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning before we leave this afternoon now to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. You may say, well, Pastor Sandra, that all sounds so good, but you don't know who I am. You know, you don't know I'm, I'm a good person. Well, hello, friend. You can't save yourself. I don't care how good you are. I'm glad you're good. It's better for society that you're good than bad, but it's not going to give you eternal life. It's only through Jesus Christ. But if you say, well, but you don't know how wretched I am way down deep inside, the things that I've thought, maybe even the things that I've done, but I'm here to inform you and encourage you that the first person, the very first person in the world to receive eternal life through the shed blood of Jesus Christ was a career criminal. And he said to the other thief at the cross, he said, he doesn't deserve this. You and I deserve it because we know how evil we are. But he doesn't deserve this. For he has committed no such crime. And then he turned and he said, this was his confession of faith, his confession of Jesus as Savior, his confession of Jesus as the answer, his confession of Jesus as the Son of God. He said, Master, remember me. When you come into your reign, remember me. Can you say that to Jesus today before we leave this building? Jesus, remember me. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you want him to say, I remember you. <laughs> I remember the day. I received a letter the other day from a, well, some time back. I opened a box and found it. Then a sister that's here today wrote me, and she said, 2014, I think it was, she said, you made a call for people who wanted to give their lives to Christ. And I went forward, and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And she has served diligently 
here in the church. She's been a light in this world. She's a leader amongst our women because the holiness, the change, the conversion, the God consciousness began to fill her life up and overflowing with love and blessings. This can happen to you today. Are you ready to say to Jesus, I receive you as my Lord. And Lord, remember me this day. Write my name in your book of life that I may know that I will live eternally and will not face damnation. Thank you for watching. Scan the QR code to get connected. We invite you to leave a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the notification button so you can know when our next video is here.